Hi. Hi, Simone. Hi. Hi, everybody or anybody. Thanks for listening to Gabbing with Girlfriends. And my girlfriend today and forever, I have known Simone Reyes forever. And um, we're catching up today. Hi, Simone. Hi, I miss you. Oh, I miss you more. And I want to see your kitty again. I know she took off, but she'll she'll circle back. <laughs> so is she more affectionate now? You know, or only she... this past like month or two did she start sleeping a little bit in the bed with me, which is like, I, I'm no like, way. and I don't move. Like if anybody calls, then it's done. Or if like a car. You sneeze. You know, anything. She's like, okay, that's it. You're done. Um, but it, she she is at the age of five. She's actually like, you're not so bad. Yeah. Uh, can you believe it? But can you believe how patient you've been? I've been so patient. And the thing is, is, you know, I have a theory, which is, you know, I've always taken in the, um, the seniors with special needs, right? I've had a blind dog. I've had a deaf dog. I've had a three-legged dog. I've had uh, animals with issues, uh, you know, behavioral issues and psychological issues. I never, ever get the kittens or the puppies because I figure, well, you know, they have a better chance of being of adopted course. than someone else, right? But I, you know, walked into a, an adoption event completely unprepared and was in deep grief after having lost my my beloved Yoda. And uh, I, yeah, my yes. And I saw this little, I've always had black cats, black and white cats, black cats. And I saw this little, this little ball in a, um, she was only three months old in a, in a little kennel. And she was so sassy because all the other kittens were like stretching. They were all sound asleep and their little whiskers were, you know, making little, you know, like blowing the wind sort of thing. They look like a, like a Hallmark movie, you know, they were like, so whatever. And every time any of them would even have one little twitch, she'd hiss at them. I was like, what is your problem? You know? And then I was like, I think I need to to take her home with me so, for the sake of all the other cats of nothing else. Yeah. And, and, and she definitely is not, you know, she's very independent and um, it, it was hard because I, I was used to literally having a dog on my hip at all times. You know, yeah. we were completely together. There was a, she was a lap dog anyway. Yes, he was. He was a complete lap dog. And, uh, and he, she's not, but had... you know, she, I feel like she knows she has to pay rent. So like, She's like, all right, let me give her 10 minutes so she doesn't freak out on me, you know, and she'll come and she'll sit and she'll purr and she'll be like, I love you. And then she's like, okay, that's it. You're done. <laughs> well, I guess that's plenty. It's kept you happy for five years. It has. It has. So that seems like yesterday, by the way. How quickly has the past five years gone? Well, we've all lost many years with the pandemic where we're just kind of like, what was that? And what is this? Like, I literally was supposed to go to a music rehearsal tomorrow <laughs> And got a call that um, the guitarist has uh, possibly COVID. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is just not going away. No, it's it, when is it going to end? It's not. We just have to live with it we do. the best we can. We but I've never, ever had a great perception of time. Like, I always think that everything was from the last time I saw somebody. Like, no <laughs> time has lapsed since the last time I saw you. You just kind of pick up and... Yes. You know, just take off where you left off. Yes. And it's, it's just weird <laughs> because, oh, she knows that we want some love in here. <laughs> oh, she's gorgeous. But to think five years since you got, since you, it's I mean, crazy. Just, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Like, yeah. And I, I was so happy to have her during the pandemic. You know, I couldn't imagine. Some of my friends don't have any animals at all in their home. And I thought, wow. And they're a friend of yours? Well, yeah, Donna, <laughs> Donna, your friend, my friend, Donna, she, but it's funny. She became a, um, a plant lady. Like she has a lot of plants. So I think her mother, you know, her maternal instinct is, is just being put on, on plants. <laughs> but I thought she got custody of the cat. That was actually, she's, she was absolutely, you know, excited to take the cat Tux to her apartment. And it turned out after talking to an animal communicator, whether you believe in that or not, mm, I do. the communicator said the reason why she's acting out and why she's crying all day. And she literally would, would meow all day long um, when Donna wasn't there. And she also seemed very out of sorts, even when Donna was there and God knows they're so close. She said, you know, the thing is, the other location with Jane, um, she, you know, she wishes you were back there because that is her home. And even though she doesn't seem to be in love with the dogs, 
just having them there means a lot to her. And she just wants to go home. Oh. So give her, yeah, so they share her, but Jane has her. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Yeah, it just, it's so bizarre to me when I know somebody that doesn't have any pets at home. I'm like, what do you do? I don't get it. I don't it. care if you've got kids. I don't care if you've got a partner. But <laughs> I just, it's not the same. I just, I don't get it. I really don't get it. Bizarre. But you've always had so many wonderful animals in your house, you know, and you're all, you're always so willing to take in more, which I love. You know, I remember being at a million events with you. And if they had animals there for adoption, there was always a chance that Gloria might take one. home. Always do that know, chance. Do you know what, Simone? It's really sad that I, I think I've reached the point in my life where I don't know if I could do it anymore. Yeah. I honestly, especially dogs, because they require so much more time and effort than a cat. Mm -hmm. And I'm down to three dogs and they're all seniors. One, we just, two of them have heart conditions, but they're fine. And one we just discovered was diabetic. Oh. And that has just turned my whole life around. That's I mean, a it's lot. like, yeah, it is. It's a whole lot. And I ain't getting any younger. And it's, it's very, it's just time consuming having dogs. And anyway, my husband just found a cat online. <laughs> it was a whole sad cat story. Oh. So he really wants to get this cat. I don't know if it's a boy or girl, but I always think dogs are. What what are we dogs or boys and cats or girls girls, but whatever. I don't know what the cat is, but he's like obsessing on this cat. And I really at a shelter or at like Yeah, a shelter. And I think that it's as he says, there's no difference really between one cat or ten cats. We have three. Yes. So there really isn't any difference. You just need more cat litter, more cat food, exactly. more cat litter. Exactly. So it doesn't take up any more time. Oh but, so well, I'm considering that. Cat. I hope you, I hope you guys do. I'm considering it, but I definitely don't think I could do a dog again because I lost my soulmate this past summer. No, I know. I, and it was just, I'm a whole new person. I'm constantly miserable. I was fairly miserable before. Now I'm constantly miserable. So Isn't that true? You know, I, I sort of let go and let God when um I just sort of had this realization and it's a really sad realization, but I just, instead of feeling like the loss of having that security and that happiness and that joy, once I just sort of made peace with the fact that I'll never really be that happy again in this lifetime, that's done for me in terms of that level, because there's no animal that can replace, you know, the animals that I've lost. And it just let me be sort of like, okay, you know, I can find joy in other places, but will I reach that level? I don't know that I would ever reach that level again. And if I don't, it's okay, because I had those great love affairs with yeah, these animals. Yeah. You know? Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about you. You grew up in New York. You're in LA now. Yeah, I'm a native so, of New York, which is why look out when I drive because we don't drive <laughs> in New York. But speaking of Teslas, did you see the Tesla story last week on the news about the guy from Pasadena with his wife and two kids in the car? I did. And it went I, over a cliff? Yeah, I saw that. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they were yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny because I, you know, I, I love the fact that Tesla is, you know, obviously vegan and, you know, zero emissions and all of that. Although I will say that, you know, Elon's participation, you know, with all of his, um, his animal experimentation. Don't left. even, don't even get me started there because that's. Yes. And also the fact that honestly, like, you know, they haven't had the great, greatest customer service. <laughs> That's true. Alexis, she's driving around and like they're catering her to her every need. And whenever anything is wrong with my car, I'm like, they throw me an Uber voucher and just tell me to get over it. So <laughs> oh, lovely. That's yeah. nice. Yeah. So it, it hasn't been the greatest experience, even though I, I, I love, you know, what it represents, you know, but they definitely seem safe after you see a car flip yeah. twice and, and land on its wheels. There's a lot of uh, car around you. You know, if God forbid you get into an accident, they're massive. Like when I first got the car, I had been driving a little VW Bug owned by my my boss, Russell Simmons. And I was zipping around and I could get into these parking spots. And I was like, this is cool. And then literally when I got the Tesla, I was like, this is a boat. I don't know how to drive this. Like I can't fit in anywhere. It's much bigger than you really think. When yeah, I, I've been a passenger once in yours. And then I have another couple friends with them too. And I've only ever been a passenger less than a handful of times. And I always feel kind of tank-like in a good way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it makes you feel safe. But um, 
it's hard. It's, you know, it's harder to maneuver around a city. You know, it's just harder. Mm. Like mm. parallel parking, I don't even try. I just keep going. I'll <laughs> go around the corner 15 times. I'm not even going to try. So. That's funny. That's funny. Okay. So you came to LA for a job. Is that right? Well, I came with Russell. Um, and you I worked been, for him in New York. Was, yeah, since I was 18. So, Is yeah. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I've been working for him my whole life, but, but I'm a New Yorker. So that, that was uh, probably my sixth job. I started working when I was 10 at um, a veterinarian uh, practice called the Cat Practice. No and, way. Yeah. So I started my first job at 10 and I'm, I think I was getting like slave labor. I was getting like 25 hours or something. I was 10. But I, I, they, I was so surprised. They gave me really important jobs. Like I, I learned responsibility very young because it was a very 70s. It was a husband and a wife. And the wife is Carol uh, Wilburn. And she's a very well-known cat behaviorist. And she wrote books like Cats on the Couch and Cats Prefer It This Way. And she was a cat psychologist, really. And so people would come in with their cats that had these issues. And she would sit down with them and figure out ways so that they could you know, keep their cats and their cats would be happy. It was very hippy dippy, but I remember being 10 and my job that they gave me as a 10 year old was I had to sit with all of the animals that were like, had tubes down their throats that had just been in surgery. And as soon as they started coughing up the, you know, the tubes, I'd have to call for help. And I thought at 10 job for me at 10, but I was like, I took it really seriously. I would just sit there and stare at them like, "Mm," you know, and I remember, my gosh, a lot of memories that's life changing it was it was a big deal but i remember one thing that, which was so funny somebody had named their cat come here like come here and i remember i was like running out i was like come here come here and they're like come here come to you and i'm like yes come here but come here come here <laughs> oh my gosh yeah, it was, really, it was a really cool experience, and they're they're sort of known as like pioneers in um, in cat care. So that was cool. That's yeah. really cool. And then and what then else did you do? Tower How did you end up with um, Russell? I worked at Tower Records, which was you know I worked there. First of all, I was going to college at night, so I needed a job during the day. But I worked there because it was the hub. It was on uh, West Fourth Street in Greenwich Village, and everybody, you know, hung out there. So I was good friends with the Beastie Boys, that sort of crew, Rick Rubin. Um, And then just celebrities would come in there, you know, at like midnight and they would be drunk and stumbling in and buying some CDs or whatever. And uh, so I kind of worked there more just because it was a scene and it was cool. And then, um, and then I heard that, that uh, Def Jam was around the corner. They were a very tiny little operation um, with rush management and they needed a receptionist. And since I was already friends with the Beastie Boys, I knew that I could get that job really easily. And I didn't want to stay at Tower Records. I didn't want to stay in like a corporate sort of thing. And I thought I was just going to stay there until, you know, college was over and then get some other job. And I never left. <laughs> so. And here you are. Here I am. Yeah. So to digress a bit, so speaking of rush management, what happened to Scott Koenig? That is so heartbreaking. You know, Scott had been, you know, and I was sort of like Facebook friends with him. I hadn't seen him in many years, but Mm. always the most dear, wonderful person, true animal lover. You know, Um, I I had heard that he had had um, uh, diabetes and we all know that diabetes is actually one of the, um, you know, the the things that put you at a higher risk if you get COVID. And my understanding is that that's what happened. And he got COVID and he Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's devastating really. He was such a great guy and he was so young. And it's just, again, it's, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, I I get very upset, you know, when people still say that like, you know, COVID doesn't kill people. COVID does still kill people. And we do have- Especially then, that was at the beginning. That was before vaccines. It was before, you know, it- and when you think of the people that died then, that... Uh, and Scott I mean, actually died later. He died after there were vaccines. Oh, he did? Yeah, oh. he did. He was vaccinated, I believe. So yeah, it, it, it's the problem is, is that it's such a new virus. We don't know how it's always going to behave. And they still don't know. And when you have people that have things like diabetes or obesity mm-hmm. or heart disease or all these you know things they can, it can take them down. They can take them down quickly. 
And I think that's my understanding anyway of what happened with Scott. And, you know, so, you know, I just, I pray that he's, you know, that he's happy and free and that we'll all have a big party one day again. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. So you ended up in LA and how many years ago was that? That was uh, like nine years ago. Oh, is that all right? Anybody. So it was very scary to me. Like I knew one person, my friend Joanne, and then I knew Russell and uh, that was it. And um, thank God, you know, for the animal rights community, I knew that I wanted to be active in the community and I was seeking out, um, you know, a community to protest and to find out where the good vegan restaurants were and things like that. And I actually was, you know, was so thrilled to see that we have such a strong, um, you know, community here of animal rights activists. And then that's where I met you and met Jane Velez Mitchell and Donna and Judy Mancuso and, and, and Diane. And we all just, you know, always had different opportunities to work together to save animals. And then we just became like the best of friends. And I started to say it's because we had a major goal or and a major spot in our hearts in common, but but I actually don't think that's true. Because, I mean, that is true. We did, but yeah. I don't think that's how we bonded because the number of different animal communities or animal organizations, how comp- it's almost like it's competitive and backstabbing and and just not vicious, but just not nice. And well, I don't get it. Difference between animal rights people um, in that community and then animal welfare people, the rescuers. And we, I've sort of just for the first time during the pandemic, I've always said, I'm not doing rescue. I don't have the stomach for it. I don't have the, the, the strength for it. I just, I will fall apart, which is still true. But when the pandemic hit and the lockdowns happened and shelters had to close their doors, it was, you know, get over yourself, get over your. Oh, but that's not true though. That's not true about you because, uh, because pre-pandemic, I remember a cow that you rescued. Okay, yes, yes. So. I would step in on occasion, but I didn't do it like on the level that I do it now where I get all these phone calls of people like, you have to say- All night them. long, yeah. You have, yeah, all night long. And I'm like, oh my gosh, now I'm really in it. And now people are coming to me to do that. And there's only so many homes I can find. And there's only so many people I can beg for money to pay for neuters and, and enclosures and all of that. But- um, And there's only so many hours in the day. There's only- So you can only do so much. And it, it's, it's true. It's, Hard. I have such respect for the, the rescuers because I just, I, I, you know, it's so emotionally draining and it's so upsetting when you literally are like, if I don't do something, this animal on my watch is going to be dead in 24 hours. And it wouldn't be my fault if that happened. It's not my fault how they get into these situations, but you feel you take it on as it's your fault. You didn't, you didn't work hard enough. You didn't save this animal. You didn't beg enough people to pay for it. You know, and that's, it's just, it's so mm. hard on your nervous system, you know. So the cow you saved ended Which up being the lot. first of many, the one that ended up at Diane's. Yes. Oh my God. Yes, yes, yes. Moonlight and moonbeam. Simone rescued a cow from the slaughterhouse floor virtually, right? Yeah. So that was um, about to give birth, which we don't yeah. even know how that could happen. In a, it in, birth at the slaughterhouse. Yeah. She, of the slaughterhouse which is um it's not unheard of but it's rare and uh of course there's no place worse to give birth is there than a slaughterhouse so um thank god you know um we had our little community with diane warren and you and and cindy brady and sean munson and um jane velez and we all were able to uh, negotiate her out with her baby and um, now they live at, at Diane's ranch and they are thriving. They're doing so well. Yeah, I love Isn't them. Isn't that nice? So great. It's so great. And then it followed with other cows. Yes. The cows so that escaped. Then nice. people started calling me about cows. And actually right now I'm sort of like in this huge um, rescue where um, I rescued along with Libra Max, um, a beautiful... Um, looks like might've been a science experiment, somebody who had um, adult cows and were trying to make a mini cow. And in doing so, um, he's very disabled. His legs are like pigeon toed. They're, they're completely in on of themselves and and he's, he's struggling to walk. And um, we, you know, he's at a wonderful, like the incredible sanctuary 
um, called Leo's and um, with Mar Mar Marlene. But um, we we're trying to work with different veterinarians and different um, orthopedics to see if there's anything we can do. It might just be pain management, um, but things like how that. Do you, how do you know he's in pain? We don't know for sure, but when you watch him walk, it's it's very um, it's very concerning. It's very concerning uh, to see his legs the way that they are, and um, so we have him on you know over the counter stuff, and we have him on um, arthritis support and things like that. But we're waiting for the vet to come with um, X ray machine, which is so cool that they can do that. In, I know that's it. amazing. It's so cool. They can, yeah, they can do CAT scans. They can do so much stuff nowadays. And so once we get all of that, because we'd rather not move him unless we have to, because Davis is so far away, it would be like a 12 hour trip, round trip. Um, if we could just get all that stuff and then, you know, have like pay for consultations, then that would be fantastic because then we can really find out, is there anything that can be done or is it more palliative care for him? You know, he is happy. I don't want to say that he's not, he's very happy. He's he, he loves Mar and he gives kisses and he loves his food and all of that. So he, how he, little is he? He's about five, 550 pounds, maybe. Um, so he, that's very small for a cow, but for, you know, just throwing him in a car and getting him anywhere, it's, it's very hard. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, um, so, okay. So that's, that's taking up a lot of your time. That's definitely keeping you busy. It is. And, you know, I still, um, I still want to continue with rescue because now I'm in it, but, um, I would much rather also just support, you know, Judy Mancuso with social compassion. I'm, I'm vice president of communications for that. And, uh, it's sort of how I was when I was protesting every second of every day, every, like for like 20 years, um, I would rather just create and get bills passed into law so that we can, you know, put people in jail if they don't do what's right for animals versus just begging them to do so. I, I want to force them to do it by law, you know. Okay, so listen to this. Um, I was I was actually just having a conversation with Stacey Kiebowitz about this, is how, like, we look at all these, I donated once to Cuddly, and now I'm getting emails from them all day, every day. I've donated far more than once now that um, I'm getting these emails constantly. Yeah. Um, but it's, you hear these horror stories. I actually just posted about one where this guy threw, um, his dog over a fence at a cell tower place. Oh my God. Yes. I saw that. Oh my God. It was on KTLA in LA. So I don't get how, like they know this person's name because the dog was chipped but nobody could find him or, or at the time a week ago, or whatever, they couldn't find him. They knew his phone number. They knew his previous address, but he had moved and right. whatever. Um, so because that had media attention, I think some people cared, but what I don't understand is I kind of lost my train of thought because I had some noise going on here. Well, you were talking about laws, creating yeah. laws. Yeah. I think that this is what's wrong. People are seem to be happy, not that anybody's happy to donate to an animal's medical issue or, um, I mean, you can't donate money to help find somebody to put them in jail. Right. And the dog actually, strangely enough, was okay. Um, it had a couple of issues, but overall it was okay. What I don't get is, and again, Stacy and I were talking about this, why with all these different animal organizations, all these different charities, why can't they, I don't know who they is, but why can't we, why can't somebody figure out a way where rewards are offered? So oh, where yeah. money's raised to offer a reward. You know, if somebody turns in this guy that threw his dog over a fence, yeah. then there's a reward to be had. Right. I don't get why that, why that doesn't happen because nobody's going to jail because nobody can find these people. Right. I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think anybody really, unless you have like one like wealthy donor, it, that never, it never happens. Right. It just never happens. And the police, they have so many other things to worry about. I don't think they're giving money to find a dog abuser, you know, like, I just don't think they are. No, I know they're not, but if people made it easy mm -hmm. or motivated others to turn in somebody, 
Yeah. And I guess the only way to, to uh, motivate somebody to turn in their friend or to turn in somebody that they happen to walk past money. is with money. So, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. There has to be a way to do this. And I know people still need to spend money I, to have to have um, the medical treatment, et cetera. But it seems like there has to be something else, too, that we're all missing. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Um, maybe we should start a campaign. We should definitely start a think tank over this because I know that we're not the only people that think this way. Or I'm no. assuming we're not. So there has to be a way to do it. On um, you know, even if we started on a tiny scale, you know, the animal abusers in LA or the animal abusers, you know, whatever, sure. and then and then take it sure. national, then take it global, it. and on we go. We see I a lot it. of people in jail. How oh, awesome would that be? That's that. my dream. That's oh, my dream. God. That's my fantasy. Yeah. All these horrible yes. people spending the rest of their lives in jail yes. after they after they get whatever it is they did to the animal, then spending the rest of their lives in jail. Exactly. The only thing better would be like exactly whatever they did to the animal, that's their punishment. Yeah, yeah. And then go to jail. That would be really fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd line up for that too. Yeah. Um okay, so that's taking up your time. And then in the midst of working for Russell, having a new baby five years ago, mm -hmm. um, and the zillions of animal um, issues that you, you conquer with Judy or with rescue or, or whatever it is, yeah. then um, you came up with a bit of a hobby too. <laughs> let's hear, let's hear about it. Yeah, this New Yorker is a country singer. <laughs> Who knew? And you're good. Thank you. So just Thank how did you someday wake up knowing that you could sing? Um, and... I always sang in the shower, you know, but I, I wasn't somebody who was like training behind the scenes or anything. I always knew I could carry a tune. And, um, you know, when you work for somebody who's like, you know, of the stature that Russell, you know, was and, and is, it's, there's no time, you know, to follow your own dreams. And, and for whatever off time I had for, you know, a good chunk of it. I had a home life that was, you know, I had a partner, I had um, a lot of animals back in New York. Um, and I would still do protests with a group called Activists for Animals in New York. So I was really, really, really busy. And so the thought of like having time to do anything else was just, there was no way. And then when I came out here, you know, um, there was still no time because I was schlepping my dog from place to place to place to place to place, following Russell around. And then um, he uh, had to step down from his businesses and he moved um, to Bali. He's been back and forth a lot, but he's he moved to Bali and decided to sort of do some healing and open up a wellness resort, which is very beautiful, like an incredible, beautiful wellness resort that he just opened. And while I was still helping him write books and doing things like that, I suddenly found myself with some extra time. And, uh, and I was like, you know what, like, if I don't, you know, do something for myself now, um, I don't know when that's going to happen. So I just kind of like dived in and I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. But um, even though I've been around, you know, the music industry, it's hip hop. It's much different. It's a much different situation than country. Um, but that's the music that I love the most. And so, you know, I, I wrote some songs with, um, with my ex-partner. And I also have original songs, you know, from other songwriters. And I just started making videos and playing out a little bit. And now I'm getting a band together to play out more. And, you know, I just feel like dreams don't have an expiration date. You know, there's a lot of nesters like real empty nesters you know and it's like it's like you doing this podcast you know like maybe you wouldn't have had time right when you were raising the kids and all this stuff but yeah, like yeah like, yeah I do it i want to do it you know for myself this is something i want to do that i can enjoy doing and something you know you probably never did before and it's amazing it's always inspirational when i see any of my friends just jumping into a new world and just being like why not why not me you know i love it it's so inspiring. It's so fun. And so like the time when um, you went up to Ojai and you you did it live. That was your first live. That was my first live. And like, yeah. Anything. Oh, and like, meanwhile, it's like a very high ticket event with a lot of really important people, like 
oh yeah, like Foo Fighters are here. Like Dave Grohl is here, like, you know, making food and like Slim Jim Phantom just walked in and like all, you know, and, and geezers there. And I'm just like, what am I doing? Like, why do I think that I can do this? But you did it. Yeah. I'm just like, I just got to a point in my life and I'm like, if you, if I'm going to wait until I'm not scared, I'll never do anything. So I'm like, I'll just do it scared. That's okay. Do oh, it no. And I'm of the mind that if you're going to do it, do it big. Yes! And, um, oh if you so big. Yeah. If you survived <laughs> that, like yes. to, for that to be your first gig it and was. you're around, so scared. And I you're around other scared. musicians. I mean, it's different if you're around celebs, period, but other musicians, that's oh. not easy. That's it really not easy. It was terrifying. So. And you know what? I didn't have in ears at the time. And, you know, in ears, I'm sure, yeah. people, you know, you can hear yourself sing. I didn't have that. And so now that I have them, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a game changer because the music is very loud and you really can't hear yourself singing, you know? And now that I have my in ears, I'm like, oh wow, I wish I had that like then. <laughs> that like when I did anything before but I have them now so I'm like okay that's that's kind of a game changer for me and how did you know how'd you know to do it um to get the in-ears to get yeah. the yeah oh. how did you know oh my producer um Al on um was like uh because I would always say I can't hear myself am I am I in tune am I like am I behind and he was just like you need in-ears like because you can't hear yourself and you can't um, so yeah, the first time we put them in, I was just like, oh, wow. And I, it immediately like up my confidence. Cause I was like, okay, like now I can hear myself and I don't have to wonder, am I like, can you hear me over the music? Am I a little flat? Like I know, cause I can hear it. And I'm just like, wow. It, it, yeah. I'm so happy to have them. <laughs> How cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so you're supposed to rehearse tomorrow. What was the rehearsal for? Because I want to get a band together. And so I'm meeting different musicians. Um, oh. I already have a, a, the guitarist and I already have my um, background singer, who's just a friend of mine who has a beautiful voice and is so good at harmonies. I'm like, wow. And, um, and then I just, I want to have a full band that's rehearsed with my songs and ready to go so that I can gig and hopefully, you know, hopefully be able to, be able to do it, you know, at a second, like, oh, oh, that band just canceled. You can go and perform and have a bunch of people that know the songs, like the back of their hand and can just go and do it. And, uh, and I don't have that, you know, when I was uh, offered something around the Super Bowl, they got canceled, something having to do with COVID or something. And I was like, I would have to, you know, audition uh, musicians, I would have to pay them out of pocket. I would need to see if they're free. And it just turned into this yeah. giant like thing. And I was like, I just need a, a core group of people. And it's fine because a lot of the people in LA, which I've learned, they're members of like seven different bands so that they're gigging all the time because they want to be able to, you know, make enough money to survive on it. Of course, it. of course. So why not throw my band, you know, my music into that so that they can be like, yeah, I know your songs. Let's go play, you know? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, you need to do that. You need to always be in a position where you could say yes because you say enough no's and people stop asking they stop asking yeah and you also need to be in a position too where you could just do something on your own acoustically yes i would love that i've got some beautiful ballads that um i think lend themselves really well to acoustic and so yeah that'll be fun too i want to do i want to do it all <laughs> and you will because you're oh, that way i hope so you are that way. So, um, so you have, so right now there's nothing live lined up. Is there no, any more? I think we to start, you know, going after gigs with, and have them say, okay, Saturday. And I'm like, no, no, I get it. I get it. Yeah. But there, um, will be, there definitely will be. Um, and also like my, my, um, my producer, Al, he's all now he's like, you can sit in, like, you can just come and just like do one or two songs, you know, with, on the back end of somebody else having a slot. So that opens up a lot of opportunities. Also. Oh, wow. Of course. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So what, um, so if people want to listen to your songs, which they absolutely should, uh, where do they go on um, social well, media? What do you do? It's mostly Simone Reyes, R-E-Y-E-S. And then um, there's Simone Reyes music on um, Instagram. Cause I sort of have two accounts. One is mostly the animal rights stuff. And then one is the music stuff. And it's not to say that they can't, you know, sort of, coincide together but I wanted to keep it separate like for now just while I'm getting my foot in the door oh, yeah I would too I mean I, I would I think that 
I think it is not that not that one kind of dilutes the other, but it's two separate issues. It's it really um, is. It's kind of like having a multiple personality thing. And that's fine <laughs> because we all do. It is because country is still very, 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 you know, heavily influenced by the sort of rodeo culture and a lot of um you know, a lot of hunting and things that I obviously am not comfortable with. Um, but, you know, Carrie Underwood is vegan. And um, I see a lot more of uh, a real change in country music. Absolutely. Um, yeah, in, in so many ways. And, you know, it used to be that you knew that there were LGBTQ um, singers, but they wouldn't really, you know, be very open about it. And now, they can be, which is so beautiful, and feel like they're going to be embraced in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of a lot of that. And uh, it's funny, Russell, you know, you would think he is the one person that would probably not understand country music at all. And uh, he actually said something the other day, which really resonated with me. He said, you know, hip hop and country are so similar. And I was like, how so? <laughs> you know, he said, because the the lyrics are written by poets about a world tell a story that they yes that they know in their soul from their childhoods you know and it is true in that way they're so similar it's sort of like wow you know i love it that's yeah i i absolutely get that i think that i mean you look at you always think that you know it you have to be kind of i'm choosing my words here but you know, kind of very right to to appreciate country music. And then you think about the Dixie Chicks, who I think are now just called the Chicks because right. people became so woke that it's too hard for me to keep up with what anybody's called. That's right. Um, so, but I mean, they were hard. I mean, they were far right. And yes. They were quite, right. quite contrary. So it's, yeah, I, I think that, I think that myth is kind of, not myth, because I guess once upon a time it mainly was true, but I think yeah. now, you know, you find country music anywhere. Yes. I mean, the days have changed since Katie Lang. I remember, you know, being protesting mm -hmm. and, and going to events with, at PETA when, you know, back in the 90s when it was River Phoenix was like the, the big animal rights activist, you know, that was new in Hollywood. And, and I remember that she came out as a vegetarian and country music stopped playing her records. Oh, and true? it was like, yes, it was devastating of course for her but she was a diehard vegetarian and she was a, a poster person for PETA and during those days it just wasn't accepted and uh, it was a big deal so now it, it's you know it's still got a long way to go but the doors are now open or at least they're they're cracked open a yeah little. no it's it, it's coming <laughs> it's coming and people have come a long way with their yeah. views and their understanding and their um, willing, willingness to try, you know, yeah. it's, I remember, you know, now you hear so much about meatless Monday that didn't yeah. exist once upon a time, no. you know, it's, um, yeah. and, I, and especially like in England, it's, uh, well, every place is meat heavy, but they were very meat heavy. And then they were quick to become vegetarians, but that was it. They weren't going to, they weren't going to take those extra couple steps to be vegan because right. that was way too scary. Uh -huh. But, um, but now it's, yes, it's Gloria. And yet the animal liberation front was born in England. Yes. Yes, it was. I mean, yes, it was. wow. You know, I know that's weird when you think how many years ago that was. And, um, and it's sad because they still have labs there. <clears throat> well, they have labs everywhere, but you would think that anyway. Um, so I think I'm losing my voice. Oh, dear. Do I sound like I am? For a podcaster, that's a problem. <laughs> oh, I think <laughs> that's probably, probably good. Um, no, but I feel um, really croaky. Everybody I know has been sick. My husband's had pneumonia. I saw that. Now. How is he feeling now? I think he's like 85% there. Okay. Okay, good. So good. he's Thank definitely you. much better. He's, hung, he's hungry. But oh, that was scary. I know. Pneumonia is, is scary. You know? I've never known anybody that's had pneumonia that I know of. So I didn't realize just how sick somebody gets. And right. the fact that he's hungry, that's a good sign. So it's a great yeah. sign. It's yeah. a great sign. I wish that I could be like, okay, tomorrow you want to do brunch at Crossroads? Yeah. Soon enough. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So um 
seems like I still have millions of things to say to you or to ask you and we're running out of time. So we'll end here so we don't have to be midstream somewhere. And then um, that means you have to come back on again. Yes. Well, there's always more animals to rescue and talk about and uh, hopefully more music and, you know, and lots of our stories because we have a lot of good stories together. What I love a about lot. what I love I, about you is that, you know, a lot of my friends, they have to really plan things out. You know, would you like to go to dinner on the 25th at seven o'clock? If not, can you go to dinner? Whatever. You are one of the only girlfriends that I had that was so spontaneous. Hey, you want to go to dinner in an hour? And I would go. I can't do it any other way. I can't. I love it. I can't. I can give a speech, uh, which I don't do often, but I can't write it out. I can't plan anything. I can't plan what I'm going to wear. If I've got an event I'm going oh, to, everybody will be like, what are you wearing? And I'm like, I don't know, until 10 minutes before I'm walking out the door. I can't really? plan anything. It's bizarre. My whole but life's I like that. that about you because, because of that, A, it got us closer a lot faster. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> we were the only two that would do something without having it already in our calendar. Totally. Yes. And because there was no like, you know, plant, like it was just, you know, when you're kind of, you know, in the same clothes you wore all day and then you're just going to get in your car. Like it's like all of your defenses are just kind of down and you're just, yeah, gonna, that's true. just very natural. And I love that because nobody else ever does that. <laughs> nobody maybe else. That, like, maybe that's my MO. Maybe that's. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, I'm because I'm glad, I'm glad we got, lucky I'm glad we got to know each other and I'm glad whatever it is that brought us together if it's the stars or if it's um yes the animals whatever it was I'm, I'm glad you're my friend I'm so hmm. glad you're my friend girlfriends are so important and I think as we get older our our circles get much smaller yes they do much yeah smaller. I think I'm down to three people now so it's <laughs> Yes. No, I love it. Everybody says, and I'm like, it's natural. I'm like, you're not weird. You know what I mean? Like that it's the same for me, but that then you really cherish the people that are in your little circle, you know, so much. You more, do. You know? And again, I, I know I keep saying this, but the older you get, the more you, you realize that life is so short that to spend it with anything, with anybody less than anybody less than you shouldn't. Yeah. No, you should so. You shouldn't. I, I used to, I used to date uh, Rex Smith <laughs> and uh, one hit wonder. He was, yeah. And he said to me once, he said, you know what? Life is too long. And mm -hmm. I thought, wow. And what he meant was, you know, to, you don't want to exhaust yourself being with somebody that you're not, you know, vibing with. I get it. You know, and I, I never, That's interesting. I like yeah. not being short because I always say life's too short, life's too short. And I still say it, it's true. But like, he was like, life is too long. You know, no, I get that. I never, I've never heard anybody say it and I've never thought about it, but I yeah. get it. Yeah. That's going to yeah. be my new thing. That's going to be my new thing, I think. Oh, well, you can thank Rex Smith. <laughs> thank me for it. <laughs> um, okay. I miss you. And um, this was really fun. And I'm going to be stalking you to see when we can do this again. Yes. We, didn't, we barely even, I had some fun. Time. Pardon? I'll get better lighting next time. You yeah, and I lighting. will quit fidgeting next time too. I have such a thing with framing. It's making me crazy. But I will, because um, I had a funny Jane story, but I'm saving it till the next one. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Thank you, Simone. Thank you, thank All you, right. thank you, thank you. Love, you, you. Guys. Love you. Speak okay. to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning in today. And be sure to follow Gabbing with Girlfriends on here so you never miss an episode. You can also find us on social media for more fun and in-depth conversations. Thank you.